Hi, I'm Chris Kramer. I'm a faculty member here in the Department of Chemistry at the University of Minnesota. After this initial welcome piece, I plan to dispense with the video. I'll still have a voiceover, but otherwise the only thing on the screen will be presentation materials. However, I did want to take this opportunity to look people in the digital eye and say welcome, and I hope you find this useful. It's also true if, if uh, tables and numbers and so forth should be large enough to be seen, so too for chemical structures. This is obviously most relevant to chemists. So here is a slide I've occasionally used to talk about some molecules in a talk I'm going to give. And I want to be sure I'll go to a back of a room and, and ensure, yes, I can see the font sizes of my atoms. I can uh, see the aromatic rings well enough and the data are there. If you need to show a three-dimensional structure, and increasingly as, as structures get larger and larger, you want to uh, be able to rotate them in some way so that people can appreciate them from various perspectives and, and understand their spatial uh, shape and, and the relationship between parts of the molecule. And so here's an example then. This is an embedded movie, and it's usually pretty effective, that assists people to see, look, there's some molecules on the inside. So this one is looping, which I often think is, is worthwhile if you know you're going to be talking for a while. So there are some acetonitrile molecules inside this large metal templated self-assembled cage. And in the course of a talk where I'm trying to explain about the interior volume or whatever, uh, if you just keep this picture static, and maybe I can stop it by clicking on it, there we go, you see it's much harder to appreciate that there's a void volume to understand that there's four vertices and it's roughly tetrahedral. It's worthwhile to have the animation. Uh, this is yet another example slide. I don't want to indulge in overkill and I don't want to run on too long for something that's online, uh, but an example of guiding the eye by introducing uh, various components one at a time. And so I'll start by saying, okay, here's a molecule I'm interested in. And it's often helpful to set things off in boxes. And the boxes may include some colors that further set it off from the page. And then I'm going to introduce some sort of a, this is a molecular orbital diagram explaining the electronic structure of this particular molecule. Again, with some sort of set off text that uh, is there. This is to speak to you about how to give a talk. Uh, and then I'll come in and say, okay, these are schematic depictions and we do calculations. And now let's see what those molecular orbitals really look like. Oh, here's a visualization of some electron density. Again, set off in a different color. Here's another one. And we compare these. And oh, look, this real one actually looks pretty close to this schematic one. And again, if this were a slide that had come up uh, initially with all the data on it, I think a lot of people would tune out as they sort of absorb all the colors and the shapes and perhaps miss what you had to say, but by flying it in, you're going to get additional uh, understanding. And oh, and finally, there's a little animation here that cements some message that's uh, meant to be brought across by that slide. Another slide that uh, I, I think kind of like the tabular one I showed where I emphasized it's good to have concepts and numbers, it's also often nice to have data. So here are some spectral data, and in particular, these are kinetic data along with a concept attempting to understand a rate equation for some sort of a reaction or set of reactions. And then finally, the conceptual and chemical drawings that specify what are the reactions involved. So all the related data and the concepts and the conclusions, they're all in one slide. And, and that's a real goal if you can do it. And now I'm going to come back to uh, sort of conclusions, whether they be interim conclusions or final conclusions. I really like the idea of circling back when you can do it. Make sure that you're cementing your conclusions to your context, to your data. So for instance, here I've gone back to that Venn diagram I showed you and told you that I used it as a, a way to sort of introduce computational chemistry. So in a talk I give to largely undergraduate audiences, I'll have some vignettes along the way and then these arrows, the blue and, the, and the, the discussion here, the gold and the green, those are related to the vignettes. And each vignette was designed to illustrate one of these concepts that came up within the introduction. So it helps to kind of nail each thing that was discussed in the talk to the introductory material. Uh, certainly, I think most of us in, uh, in scientific fields, we want to thank our coworkers when we're all done. And uh, it's particularly nice to have some sort of visual that shows smiling faces and identify the individuals. This is one I've used in the past. And it, of course, this is a very much a matter of personal style. So it is uh, e up to each individual. And, but 
you know, science is a human endeavor, so thanking your human coworkers, getting across to an audience uh, that it's people who, who contribute is, is only to the good of our scientific endeavors. And now I'm, gonna, I'm starting to wrap up here, and so I'm going to give you the, the best parts of the talk, which include the dirty little secrets. So I just came across as a pointy-headed expert, and uh, I claim that I have deep insights into exactly how to give a talk. Uh, but, you know, rules are made to be broken to some extent. So while I believe, after a lot of experience giving and listening to talks, I've given you some good, good advice, I'll also say that I have violated myself every one of the things I just told you you should or should not do. However, it was only after thinking about it, recognizing that I was going to violate a best practice rule, and asking the question, is the payoff for doing that large enough that it's worth it? Right? I'm going to, I'm going to indulge in a bit of unprofessionalism, but with a purpose. Maybe to engage an audience, maybe to provoke somebody in the audience, hopefully in a nice way, not in an aggressive way, but uh, in an effort to get something started that otherwise might not have happened. So, for instance, at the end of a talk, here is a particularly garish animation along the lines of the fourth grader animations I was telling you to avoid. And, uh, you know, it's the 21st century, it's the century of irony, as I like to say, so maybe I'd put that at the end of this talk to be ironic. And as a result, maybe you smile and you nod your head a little bit, and it uh, just helps you remember the talk just that much more. And of course, the very last thing you want to do when you give a talk is you want to invite questions and discussion. That is, for 95% of all talks, that's assumed. You're not trying to rush through. You've left enough time. And, you know, the question and answer session is a particularly important one. I don't have a bunch of bullet points here that I want to get across. What I will say is it, it's great to listen carefully to the question to decide whether you think the audience understood the question. Of course, if you don't understand the question, it's good to ask for clarification. But it's good to think, will the general audience understand that question? Because maybe it was, in fact, highly specific, highly specialized, but you don't want to keep it at that level. Those are the sorts of questions you might like to repeat and explain to the audience in a more general way what that question means. Don't repeat every question. I've, I've been to job talks like that where somebody was once told, repeat every question so everyone can hear it. Okay, if you didn't think it could be heard, sure, repeat it. But don't just arbitrarily repeat every question. It just looks canned and rehearsed. Uh, so those that need it because of volume or because they were very specialized, sure, go ahead and do that. And then try to give a direct answer. And if you do think that it you need to go beyond the direct answer because it raises something really interesting, you can really use it as an opportunity to get a little extra information in. So remember, I told you, don't go long. But sometimes a question invites you to add stuff that you had to cut for time purposes, and now you get to work it in. And instead of looking disrespectful at having run your audience right up to the limit, instead you've impressed people with how much more there is to your work uh, and how deeply you've thought about things, and that is a much better payoff. You, you can uh, trust me on that. Um, I like to walk towards a speaker uh, who asks me a question and to sort of engage with them closely, as well as you know lift my head, make eye contact with the audience, uh, because that'll make others just that much more willing to ask you a question. They see that it's a, a give and take and it's going to be fun. Uh, keep answering questions until your host tells you not to, I think is a good thing. And finally, of course, once it's all done and hopefully you receive some polite applause, it's nice to smile, it's nice to say thank you, and you're all done. Now you can go and reap the rewards of your fabulous presentation. So that wraps up what I have uh, to say on this subject. I sincerely hope people find this useful. If you uh, would like to communicate with me, whether you did find it useful, you certainly are welcome to. Uh, you can email me at kramer at umn.edu, C-R-A-M-E-R, at U-M-N, like University of Minnesota, dot edu. Note that if I had been better prepared, I'd have had a slide at the end with this. Uh, and I'm also on Twitter, and my Twitter handle is chemprofkramer, all one word. And I'd love to hear from you that way, too. So, wonderful to have offered this to you, and all best wishes for professional...